Lagos Business School, Pan Atlantic University. It's a pleasure to be here again to be talking about a very topical issue opportunities in the agribusiness sector and the question of whether we are at a crossroad. But I'm going to begin by sharing what we usually do. What we usually do. Like she said, that one hat that I wear today is that I'm a farmer. True, I'm a farmer. Let me just share briefly before I go to the slide what I did. What we teach in the business school is that you should identify a gap. Always look for gap. And when you find that gap, you try to close the gap. So one day as I was observing one of the cocktail parties, I observed that each time they carry the snail tray, each time they are carrying these fried garnish snails, that it takes participants less than two minutes to take everything. When we organize the convocation ceremony, and they are bring, each time they bring out the snails, it takes participants less than three, five minutes. They've taken everything. It means that there's a high demand for it. But that product is actually a luxury brand because it is expensive. And I felt that I could go into this and begin to produce this. So I started researching. The first thing I did was to research on snails. And I stumbled on one giant snail actually lays a thousand eggs in a laying season. I stumbled on this. One lays a thousand eggs in a laying season. I also stumbled on the fact that it takes you two years that one of these giant snails sells for between 500 naira and 600 naira, but the hoteliers sell it for 1,500. And I started doing the number. If one snail can lay 1,000 eggs and I can do it right, it means if I can do 2,000 snails, multiply by 1,000, it will give you the number. And I did, just like every one of us would do. We do the profit on the table. And I did the profit analysis. And it came to, if I'm doing a 2,000 snails, I probably would have invested close to 5 million at the end of two years, but the returns is about 500 million if I do it right. I quickly jumped into it and said, wow, so I can make 500 million. Why am I in class teaching? I quickly jumped into the idea of producing snails. And I started, I went and told my wife, look, we need to do this. I bought 2,000 snails, 2,000 species of Akatina, Akatina snails, and started producing. I was looking out for the eggs, looking out for, <laughs> Do you know what happened? The snails started dying. <laughs> they started dying. By the end of one month, I had lost like 50. By the end of two months, I kept on losing snails. It got to a point that what was left was about 500. So I called my wife, quickly kill these snails so that we don't lose all. <laughs> That's how we think here. That's how we think. I told her, just let's kill them. But in the process of killing, I started observing certain things. I started seeing the errors and the mistakes that I made. I started understanding that there's a particular insect that poisons them. I also got to know that they are carnivores. They eat themselves. When one is sick, the others eat. They are infected too. That was why they were dying. I also understood that the rats were picking the eggs. When they pick the eggs at night, or bats will come there. So a lot of things were going on. This animal does not move in the daytime. They move at night. I didn't realize all of this, that whilst we are sleeping, they are active. So I started, it took me six months. I started on studying snails. Now, it took me less than one week to jump into this. It took me more than six months to begin to understand snails. And when I went back into it, I started hashing the snails. So today, I do snails. But again, you can see the way I stumbled into it. That's the same way we stumble into business. So we're going to look at, we're going to look at agribusiness value chain. And we're looking at Nigeria at a crossroad. Are we actually at a crossroad? What's the problem? Where exactly are we? What sector holds the key to unlocking Nigeria? 
So these are the issues that we're going to look at. Is Nigeria at a crossroad? Why, why, did, why is it that the narrative has changed? Why is everybody talking about agribusiness? In fact, why is the government still holding on to agriculture? They're saying agriculture holds the key. We're going to look at some of the value chains that takes us to the concept of agribusiness. So the term economic diversification has increasingly been overflogged. The government has said a lot. Right from 1970, we've been diversifying the economy. We've been diversifying. So since 1970, the narrative and discussion on diversification remained the same with very little change. Government comes up and it says, we want to do this in the agricultural sector. The last political dispensation talked about transformation agenda in the agribusiness sector. In fact, agricultural sector transformation. They pumped in a lot of money into that sector. What happened? Was there a reasonable change in the sector? I don't think so. To, to many, diversification is simply returning to agricultural sector. That was the dominant sector in the 60s. They said that is the way to go. The answer, what is agricultural sector? The key to increase wealth? The answer is no. Agriculture does not hold the key. If you're holding on to agriculture, you're making a fundamental flaw. I was with the MD of Saro, Saro Agro Allied, yesterday, and he said something important, very key. He said, if you want to play in the downstream sector of the agricultural value chain, you want to produce, say so you're going to be poor for a very long time. In other words, he's saying, if agriculture is what you're holding on to, you're going to be very poor. He also said one thing, that he has friends in three layers. Some are billionaires. Now, these friends of his are currently going into agribusiness or agriculture, and they've invested close to $2 billion or more. And he said they are wasting their money. And true, they're actually wasting their money because they don't understand the sector they are going into. So the answer is simply no. Agriculture does not hold the key. But opening up of the agribusiness sector, opening up of the entire value chain, holds the key to unlocking the so-called wealth. So we ask, what then is diversification? A diversified economy is an economy with a wide variety of sectors that are interconnected and interrelated by way of complementarities and commonalities. Let's give an example. If I'm going to do cassava, and I'm looking at the cassava value chain. Recall that there's a woman who farms the cassava. But if I'm going to play at the end of the value chain, the upper, upstream of the value chain, I probably will say I want to do ethanol. I want to do spirits because I can export spirits. I can export ethanol. If that is what I want to do, then I need to play. I need to have a say in the people that are producing the cassava. I also need to have a say in the kind of cassava that they are planting. Otherwise, they plant a variety that will not help me in producing um, ethanol. So a diversified economy is an economy with a wide variety of sectors that are interconnected and linked together by commonalities and complementarities. The availability of such diverse sector prevents negative economic disorder such as the contagious Dutch, uh, Dutch disease. You know, today we've caught the Dutch disease again more than four times since 1970. So the need for economic diversification can be seen amongst the cooperation of the, the Gulf Cooperation Council countries. Now these are oil majors, oil exporting countries that came together in 2014 to deliberate on the way forward, just like we are doing today. We are looking at how do we deepen, how do we increase our wealth by diversifying into other sectors. So these countries, which are major oil producing and exporting countries, were seeking the best ways to diversify their economy away from the volatile oil sector. The consensus reached in the conference was that there was a need to create a non-oil tradable sector in addition to providing competitive business environments. So one of us here told me, this is what I want to go into. I want to go into production of a particular variety. And I asked the question, are you competitive? Is it not cheaper to import this same product than to produce it in Nigeria? If you can produce it here 
are you sure the Asians will not flood our market with this particular brand such that it will drive you under? So Nigeria today, like the Gulf, Gulf Corporation Council countries, is caught in the web of the famous Dutch disease with crude oil price currently trading at $48 per barrel. And our production capacity has shrunk to 1.4 million barrels per day. Recall that we said we are going to do 2.2 million, but our current production is 1.45 million. Nigerian's crude oil production capacity, which was 2.2 million, is currently at about 1.2. Now, if you look at where we were in 2015, we we're actually number 13 among the 20 exporting oil producing and exporting countries. If you look at where we currently are, Amongst those 20, we are number 19. It means there's a problem. In terms of revenue, there's a problem. So since the oil exchange rate, since the oil exchange rate crisis and the declining trend in the oil price began, Nigeria has fallen from being the 13th to the 19th position amongst the 20 leading exporting countries. So in, in the August edition, we are going to explore the diversification and exploration of the opportunities in the agribusiness sector. The question we need to ask here, is Nigeria the crossroad? What is the current state of the economy? What are the opportunities open to businesses in the country? Are we at a crossroad? Is Nigeria currently at a crossroad? What are the, the current states? What's the current state of the economy? What are the opportunities open to us? The truth is that Nigeria is currently at the crossroad, as indicated by declining trends in major macroeconomic indicators. We are going to see all the indicators. They are all in red. The state of the Nigerian economy is visibly seen. In the wide swing in the official exchange rate, if we look at where we were in 2014 and where we currently are, by 2014, the exchange rate was exchanging at 160 to, 160 to $1, as against 172 to one dollar, if you look at the difference between the interbank foreign exchange and the bureau de change. By July 31st, 2016, both rates were exchanging at 315.5 and 375. Currently, we are looking at um, 310, hovering between 308, 310, 315, and 390. Now, if you look at the devaluation that has taken place, it's between 94% for the interbank rate and 120 seven percent from 2014 to date this has actually thrown most businesses abroad it has actually caused confusion in most uh, firms by the same token nigeria's gdp growth rate has declined to an all-time low of minus 0 0.336 percent whilst inflation and unemployment are put at 16.48 and about 12.1 percent this is a classic case of a stagnating economy in fact at the first quarter report we were we, Nigeria became what? We entered the phase we class as stag, stagflation. You know, we used to hear inflation. We entered the stage we describe as stagflation. And going forward, by the time they come up with the, the second quarter report, we are likely to enter another phase. And that phase is a recession. Technically, they say we are in a recession. And when we look at the declining trend in macroeconomic aggregate shows Nigeria is at the precipice of either degenerating into a full-scale recession or transforming into a fully productive nation through diversification and restructuring of the economy. If we can restructure the economy, then we are moving in the right direction. However, if we do nothing, if we do nothing, if we pay lip service to the current trend, we will sink further into a recession. But the question confronting us includes how deep is the current macroeconomic crisis? What sector holds the key to diversifying the economy? What are the new opportunities and how can these new opportunities or areas be explored? If we look at the first quarter economic outlook and the budgetary highlight of 2016, we we'll probably will see, you can see the arrows are all coming down. The arrows are all coming down, which shows that there is a problem. If you look at overall balance, government is spending more than, if you look at the first quarter 2014, just look at the expenditure, first quarter 2014, and look at our expenditure, first quarter 2016. The government does not have money, but yet we are spending more than, 
Can you see where is the government getting the funds to spend at this rate? You can see all the indicators are showing negative. And where you see positive, let's look at the positive. Expenditure is rising. The current expenditure is also rising. Where you see negative, it shows us that there is a problem. And this problem cuts across the um, board. So how do we address all of this? And all of this problem came as a result of our focus on the oil sector. We concentrated our effort on one major sector, which is the oil and gas um, sector. So what is the way out? Is it diversification? What sector holds the key? Is it the agribusiness sector? Agribusiness is not the same as farming or agriculture. They are two different things. It is not the same. If you set out that you want to do maize, if you ask the poultry farmers today, what is your problem? They will tell you that there is no maize. The poultry farmers will tell you there is no maize. Now, if you decide to close the gap by going into maize production, what kind of maize? What is the quality of maize you're going to produce? What variety are you going to produce? If you plant the variety that we have in the market today, you're going to plant a variety that has aflatoxin. We cannot export our maize. We cannot export our maize because it has, it has a toxin called aflatoxin. But there's a variety that IITA has come up with that is free of aflatoxin. But how come people are not moved in that direction? Because the likes of most of the companies in the food and beverage industry are looking for maize. And they are looking for aflatoxin free maize. How come people are not aware that there's an answer to that problem, that we can actually export our maize? So agriculture is not the same as farming or agriculture. Agribusiness is not the same as farming or agriculture. It encompasses all sectors that are interconnected and linked together by commonalities and complementarities from the farm to the final consumer. It means that we're looking at the entire value chain. Now, if you say agribusiness is agriculture and you set out to plant tomato, you set out to plant as simple as the tomato, when you harvest, the challenge they have is that at harvest point, they lose 50% of their proceeds. It means that whatever they produce does not get, or the route to the market has a lot of what? Gaps and shocks that will make them lose 50% of their produce. Again, the shelf life of the tomato that they are going into is about seven days. It means that if you produce and you don't have what? Means of storing it. It will decay and go bad. And that's what happens to us. And it's been happening to us. Yet we are not taking the lead to do anything about it. Increasingly, we're having farmers, we're having those that are entering agribusiness sector say, now that there's greenhouse technology, I want to buy. You know, I started by saying some have the money. The ones that are billionaires are buying up the greenhouses without asking a fundamental question. What am I going into? What exactly am I going into? Where am I going to sell these um, products? So agribusiness includes agricultural inputs industry. So we have agricultural machinery, equipment and tools, fertilizers, pesticides, insecticides, irrigation system, and improved seed production. It means I can decide to go into just seed production and not even go into farming, just addressing one end of the value chain. Now, the production at all levels of agricultural activities, here we look at crop production. We have cereal, we have maize, we have rice, sojourn, corn, millet, and wheat. Now, one of the things we export we import is wheat. We spend so much money importing rice and wheat. If not for the what? The technical ban on foreign exchange. You probably would have seen the government carry rice in their report, how much they've put in rice imports. Recall that before the crisis, a bag of rice was sold for 9,500 naira. A bag of mama gold was sold for 9,500 naira. Today, Mama Gold is not in the market. 
you're going to find two varieties. You find the one they call agric and the one they call Thai rice. The Thai rice is about 19,000 to this price. The agric, which is the Nigerian rice, that's the one they call agric, is also tracking the Thai lands, about 17,000. Now you can see the Nigerian rice is not hit by exchange rates, but yet the Nigerian rice is tracking what? The foreign rice. It means that there's a new opening. There's a new opening. Now most of your FMCGs that are into food and beverage, they need your what? Cereal. They need all of this. But we need to do what? The right variety to be able to meet this um, demand. Now we have root crop, cassava yam, ginger, potato, and cocoa yam. The interesting thing here is that the yam that you produce in Nigeria cannot be sold outside Nigeria. When you go to UK and you buy yam, it's yam from Ghana you're buying. Your yam will not pass the standard test. We have legumes, soya beans, groundnuts. Remember that from the soya beans, you have the soya milk. Very rich in soya milk. You have your groundnuts, your cow pear. India alone demands our groundnuts. If you look at where we export to, our trading, the number one trading partner is India. And India exports, imports our groundnuts. Fruits, you have mangoes, banana, oranges, guava, pepper, pineapples. If you look at pineapples, most of the pineapples you take in Nigeria are actually imported. There are two varieties. You have the sweets, the sweet one that, you know, the ladies grate this pine, pineapple. The one that we produce, when you try to blend and grate it, what happens? It has seeds. Now, the one that we import from Cotonou is very smooth. It's like pap. When you turn it around, it's like pap. Now, we import what? We spend a lot of money bringing in what? Now, some of those purple that you buy, for those of us that buy purple, the purple comes from outside Nigeria, except for some companies like Chi that, is going, that has gone fully into purple. So we buy, we import papaya from the neighboring um, countries. We load it and bring it in and we buy. Now, every time you're buying, what exactly are you doing? Foreign exchange, you're exchanging dollar to do what? To buy. Your mangoes, we produce mangoes in commercial quantity but we cannot sell our mangoes outside Nigeria. You cannot even take your mangoes to ShopRite. So what you see in ShopRite, you probably will see that there's no spot. Those mangoes don't have spots. It means that we are doing what? We are bringing in those mangoes, except for some few, few young farmers that are going into this and they are doing the right thing. So all of this tells us that there is a gap there's a huge gap in terms of going into all of this. We have the vegetables, the cabbage, the green pepper, the carrots, the lettuce, spice, onion, melon. <coughs> in fact, we met a woman. I took participants in my agribusiness program to, to one of the political farmers. I'm not going to mention his name, but he's one of the political farmers. He makes a lot of noise. He talks about agribusiness. He talks about farming. So I thought that his farm was worth visiting because one of the, the program I run, we take them out. We take participants to the field. So we took participants to that farm in Ekpe. When we got there, we saw he had a tractor. The tractor was idling away, doing nothing. He had massive land that had been overtaken by weed. Political farmers, they make a lot of noise, but yet there is nothing. Yield per hectare is near zero. So the question is, we, in the course of going to that farm, we met a woman who was doing what? Chili pepper. She was producing a specialized pepper for export, not for the Nigerian market. Producing a specialized pepper, and she was so excited receiving the LBS team. We didn't go for her, but we were excited seeing that a lady was into chili pepper. We have three crops, oil palm, cocoa, rubber, coconut, cola nuts. Cola nuts, there's another variety which I didn't put there. The bitter cola, highly medicinal, yet we don't plant it. The bitter cola, the coffee shell. Now, when you look at the tree crops, some of these tree crops, if you're going to go into it, you know they say diversify, diversify and diversify. If you decide to go into oil palm today, how many years will it take you to begin to make profits? 
We need to figure out this. It will take you seven, eight years. If you plant today, it will take you seven, eight years. So each time the government is saying, we are diversifying the Nigerian economy, looking at the medium term plan, the budget, they're actually telling a lie. You don't diversify an economy in one year. It takes time for you to do what? Move resources and move people towards that direction. So if you're going into cashew nuts, cashew is one of the things we export. If you must go into cashew north, it takes you close to seven years. Having planted, you nurture the field for years before it starts producing. Once it starts producing, you have a steady flow of income. But you're not going to be super rich because you're creating value. You're trying to solve the problem for society. So you're not going to be super rich. You're going to be comfortable, but not super rich. Farmers are not super rich. Farmers, this is one sector where your income is steady over time. It doesn't go up and down, just like recycle that you find in other businesses. We have processing and packaging of agricultural output. If we take your tomato, how do we package our tomato? We use the basket. From the raffia palm, we make this basket from Benue to Lagos. We move them on top of trailers. By the time they get to Lagos, half those tomatoes are broken. Half, half the tomatoes are broken. So we need people who will begin to look at that sector to say, this is what we want to do. We want to come up with a packaging that will do what? Reduce, minimize the loss and the breakage within the value chain. If you're looking at egg, the egg market, the egg market, you see that a kind of dynamic change is taking place within that market. We used to use this paper what? paper uh, package, what they use in the crates they use for those eggs. Today they are using what? Synthetic fiber. We now have what? Disposable plastics that you use and throw away. This is because innovation is gradually coming into that sector. So we have processing and Greek output into food and beverage, tobacco products, leather and leather work products, textile footwear and garments, wood and woodwork products, rubber, now, all of these things that I put here, it's not rocket science. Do you know that some of the trees that we use in making all of this, it took 100 years for you to grow those mahogany. It took close to 150 years for you to grow some of those trees that we've cut down. But we've been cutting down and not planting. So if we decide to diversify the economy, it means that there must be a systematic move towards what? Replanting those things that we have lost. But we're not yet there because we're not replanting the, the trees. So if I must go this way, I must plant and know that this is a generational business. This is not a business that will give me money this year. It's a business that will take time for me to make back my money. Development and fabrication of appropriate technologies for on-farm processing and, and secondary processing. Now, if you look at the fish value chain, I can talk through the entire value chain. If you look at the fish value chain, first thing you do is the capital. Huge capital you set up in doing what? In doing your fish tank. When you finish spending that money, at the point of harvest, you now want to sell. Because after five months, four or five months, you don't want to continue feeding the fish. Because as you feed them at that stage, you're making a loss. You're impacting on your what? You're making a loss when you continue to feed them. You want to sell off. At that point, who are the people that will come and buy your products? Farmers or those in this sector, all they see and want to hear is that I want to go into this business. They go into it without looking at the market. Where am I going to sell? Where am I going to sell this fish? When you get to that point, you discover that the market women, they come to you, they say, bring them out. Bring, drain the water. Once you drain the water, they say, bring them out. As you're bringing them out, they underprice the products. At that point, if you pour back the water, some of the fishes will die. So the farmer is left handicapped. You don't know what to do. And you get so frustrated that you sell off the first batch and you say, this is a useless business. But however, we need to transit into what? Value addition. We need to add. There are some. You have FIRO and Institute of Oceanography, they've come up with all kinds of what? Methods that you can use to do what? They fabricated machines 
ranging from 250 to about 350,000, depending on the number of grams that you want to do or dry. So if you finish your fish, you can dry it, and you can process it once. You can store dry or store wet, so that you will not be at the mercy of those players that you find within the value chain. So agribusiness sector holds the key to transforming the Nigerian economy because of the following favorable supply and demand conditions. In fact, at no time, today we have what? Very favorable conditions. And these conditions are outside the government control, completely outside the direction that the government is uh, taking. So the agribusiness sector employs between 60 to 70 percent of Nigerian rural and urban population and contributes about 30 percent to our annual GDP. So it's a way to, to go. Nigeria has competitive and comparative advantage in the production of food crop, tree crop, legumes, rice, fruits, vegetables, and crop production. There are so many of these crops that we don't plant. They grow on their own. In fact, animals plant the, your oil palm seedlings. It is animals that do what? That plant them for us. They are scattered all over the place, yet we do nothing with them. Nigeria has all year round favorable, favorable climate. Every time you hear that there's a bumper harvest, it's not because we did anything spectacular. It's because God has given us what? Favorable weather, there's favorable sunlight, and good rain during the rainy or the wet season. The size of the country's arable land is about 84 million hectares, with only about 40% fully utilized. Meaning that when you're traveling from here to Onitsha, you look to your left and to your right, all you see is vast wasteland. We've taken the tree, we've chopped off what? The major resource, which is the log, we've taken it as log, and we left the land there. So we have what? Arable land that we are underutilizing. Nigeria has 279 billion cubic metric of surface water and a potential irrigable area of 3.14 million hectares. It means that water is not our problem. There are countries that water is their problem. The country's current population is about 182 million, with a projection of 397 million by the year 2050, not 2015, 2050. Nigeria will become the third by 2050, not 2015, will become the third most populous country in the world. It means that we will have many mouths to feed, many mouths to feed. So there's a new will by the government and all stakeholders to move away from the oil sector to the non-oil sector through the launch of the Commercial Agricultural Credit Scheme. Now each time I checked, the last time I checked and I looked at banks that were giving loans, they actually gave out loans. Who did they give these loans to? Who are these farmers? What exactly are they into? So we have the Nigerian Initiative Rigs Sharing Agricultural Lending. Nisra, all of these are the direction that the government is moving is to do what? Encourage a move out of. But each time I look at the opportunities and we begin to look at, is it so easy to see the opportunities? The central bank delisted about 41 items from accessing foreign exchange. And when you look at those 41 items, pick out the agri-based product from those 41 items, you're going to see that the opportunities are now what? More. It is no longer profitable for you to bring in what? Carcinogenic. What? You know the kind of beds, the frozen chicken that we bring in? They use formatly hide to preserve them before they find their way into our market. It is no longer profitable for you to even bring in those chicken because of the current exchange rate. It means right now there's a gap even in the poultry sector. There's a gap in terms of the beds. There's a gap in terms of the feed feed formulation. There's a gap in terms of what? Packaging and distribution of live beds. So if you look at all of this, it tells us where should we play? This session is not designed to tell you where to play. Like I said, it is about identifying a gap and you run with that gap. This is not to, de to design and tell you this is where we should go. If you play, play the oil and the oil palm and canal, the palm oil and palm canal sector. If you look at the value chain of the oil palm, it is from the oil palm we have what? Soap. We make soap from that sector. It is from the oil palm 
the ladies will tell you that they buy what? They buy groundnut oil. The groundnut oil they buy used to be imported. Imported from Malaysia. The groundnut oil is not groundnut oil. It's bleached palm oil. They bleach palm oil and sell to us. It means that if we treat this sector very well, it could be a what? A cash cow for us. But however, we are waiting for the government to take the lead. It is a private sector that must what? Must take the lead in looking at all of this sector to determine which sector we want to play. So Central Bank came up with this list. And this list is a good way to start. Look at, we were importing eggs. You know the kind of eggs we are importing? Not raw eggs. Not raw eggs. We are importing powdery eggs. You know, these countries produce in excess and they turn their eggs into powdery substance and they sell to the bakers. So we were importing that eggs and government said, no, we are not going to allow you to have access to forex. Is there a way we can do that in Nigeria? We need to sit down and think. If we can think through all of this, then there will be a way out of our current um, predicament. So a look at the current population dynamics and the total trade dynamics supports the call for full diversification for us to go into sectors that are viable. Sorry about this. What is interesting here is this age grade. Age grade between 14, 15 to 59. It says by, 20, by, by, by the year 2050, this is where we'll be. Our population will be made up of what? Now we have Nigerian population, Nigerian population age distribution 2015. This is where we are 2015, and this is where we are. This is where we will be in 2050. And he's saying that in 2050, the age grade between 15, 15 to 59 will be made up of what? 54.4%. Whilst the age grade between 0 and 14 will be made up between what? 35.2%. Now these people take milk. These people take dairy products. These people will feed. We need to do what? Begin to think in the direction of solving the food crisis that is looming, even within and amongst uh, this um, sector. Same story goes for the global population. When you look at the world population, most of the European nations are experiencing decaying population. The African economy are experiencing what? An explosive population. So we need to feed these people. If you look at our export and you look at what we expanded the value of our major exports in Q1 2016. You will see the, those that are highlighted are actually what? Agri-based products. The things that are highlighted are agri-based products. If you look at the value of our imports, you will see the red. We were actually importing fish, mackerel and frozen food. We were actually importing milk and cream in powdery substance. Can you see? We were actually importing Mixture for the fight substance for food and drink industry. Now, we were actually importing sugar, cane sugar specified for sugar refineries. We were doing what? Wheat, not in seeds. Now, if you look at all this, it creates what? We were importing things that we can produce. So all of this shows us that there's a gap, but we need to understudy these uh, various sectors. If you look at the share, percentage share of our total import, you will see that oil and gas sector takes about what? 15.5% amongst the list. If you look at our percentage share of our exports, you will see that petroleum and oil, that's the last year. Can you look at our export? You are seeing 64.72%. So what defines our economy? Oil, 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 which is a problem. We sell oil and we import back finished uh, uh, products. So the major sectors, the, with the current exchange rate crisis has thrown, into, thrown open, uh, the poultry, meat, beef, and the grain sectors. Now these sectors are the sectors that there's currently a gap. Before the exchange rate crisis, Nigeria was importing almost 50% of her poultry need. This including eggs, breeder beds, and frozen chicken. With the current devaluation, it is economically unviable to import food and grains. This means there's a gap in this sector, but many small scale farmers that have ventured into this sector in the past lost significantly. Now this is a problem of every 10 farmers that ventured into the poultry business in the past. Now this statistics is coming from my experience in the class, managing the agribusiness program for the last four years. 
of every 10 farmers that ventured into this business, at the end of two years, only about one will be left. So we've seen people who invested 25 million in the poultry business, and they were literally crying when we were teaching this in class. They lost all their money after two years. So we need to find out why. Why were they losing their money? Is the sector not lucrative? So it's a known fact that of every 10 small and medium scale farmers that ventured into this sector, only one or two will be left in the business after two years. Why is the agribusiness sector so lucrative on paper, yet so prone to shock in reality? Why is it so lucrative on paper, yet so prone to shock in reality? What are the challenges with venturing into agribusiness? The answer lies in our approach to venturing into the sector. This is a country where we are moved by bandwagon effect. This is a country where we are moved because our friend has moved. It's like playing the chess game and you, somebody moves the pawn and you move another pawn. It's a country where because my friend is in it, I have to be in it. So we have too many people jumping into what they do not know or they barely have control over. We are a people driven by profit taking rather than by value creation. The decision to invest in the sector is usually devoid of well laid out plan and vision. We usually don't know what we are going into, just like the first example I shared. The first example I shared, the example of how can I invest five million and make, it, make 500 million. We need, if we do that number, you will see that it is, that's the truth about the scenery. You put five million and you make 500 million at the end of two years, if you get it right. How can that be? And I quickly jumped into it and got my fingers burnt. That's how we reason. We do the calculation on paper. We look at the poultry business. You see, when I have, when I have 3,000 beds, 10,000 beds, I do 10,000 beds. They calculate the money from 10,000 beds. I shared this in, the, in one of the executive MBA class, and the class decided to float a farm. They were looking at farming. Now they decided to float a farm without getting a consultant to look at this business, without sitting down to understand what they were going into. They were able to raise 50 million, and they jumped into, they jumped into the poultry value chain. And I tell you, after two years, each of the participants kept on saying, I only invested one million, so <laughs> I only, what my stake there is just one million, I can as well let it go. I only invested one million, I can as well let, they lost the 50 million. They lost it. That's why we say agribusiness is business. And it must not be treated with what? With kids' globes. It is something that we must sit down and understudy the sector that we are going into. So failure in the sector has more to do with inability to close the knowledge gap. Now there's a study that was conducted that I used in one of the cases in class. They said the first fundamental problem is government. Government is the first problem. But usually I tell them rule out government, forget the government. This is one sector that we can operate without the government. You know how. If I decide to go into plantain production, mind you, I am not going into plantain production for production of dodo. If I'm going into plantain production for production of dodo, and what? I'm plantain chips. It means I'm doing everything. I'm entering a such a water business or a pure water business. Are we getting this? It means I'm not strategic. I'm not thinking. But if I decide to go into plantain, and I have, let's say I have a 50 hectare farm, and I want to do I'm, maybe my soccer that I have is about 10,000. I have 10,000 soccer that I want to put in that farm for the first. Remember that I will not cover my 50 hectare farm. Now, if you do a 10,000, 10,000 soccer the first year, what will happen the second year? Multiply 10,000 by five. For every plantain that you cut, it produces five soccer. These five shoots are what you are going to use to expand. So multiply the 10,000 by five. Next year, it will give you 50,000. It means you are spreading out 50,000. So if you have a plan of six years and you are doing plantain, not for dodo. Plantain for what? Plantain flour. 
that I'm going to do plantain flour for export. And I'm going to do it right. Not dodo, not plantain chips. If we think in this direction, then we are answering the question because there's a gap. Plantain chips. Remember, there's also what? Plantain nodu. Now, the Indomie nodu that we eat is not what? Does not have any nutritional value. But they've sold it to children and they're selling it to adults. But I can come up with the plantain nodu. The plantain nodu is rich in what? Iron. But is there plantain doodle in the market? No. It's not in the market. So this one is new. This is something that anybody can pick. So profit taking and the payback period. The agribusiness sector and the agribusiness, the agricultural and agribusiness sector is one sector that has a long gestation period. It is a frustrating business. If you don't get it right, if you make mistake, go back. But we don't want you to make mistake. We don't want you to fall into that trap of making mistake because it could be costly. Like the, the, the MD of Saro that I was sharing with yesterday said, there are three layers of people. You have the super billionaires. They don't know what they do, they throw their money. Then you have those who are about retiring. They take their retirement what? Money and launch and lose everything. Then you have those who don't even know. They, they've not, never held cutlass. The upcoming young ones, because they have no job, and they say the alternative is what? The three layers we need to do what? Teach them. That farming can be done in a profitable manner. So an examination of the poultry value chain. When we want to go into poultry, one thing we see is what? Egg and what? Eh? We see egg, and we see the what? The chicken for what? Now, look at the poultry value chain. Most small would be entrants only see the following. Layers and broiler production, egg production and sales, sales of spent bed. These are the three things they see. They don't see the big picture. Now, this is the entire value chain. This is the poultry value chain. The poultry value chain actually starts with what? Maize, sunflower, and soya beans cultivation because we need to formulate the feed. We need to formulate the feed. We need to understand how they do it. Maize, sunflower meal, and, and soya meal formulation. Import of ammonia acid and vitamins and medicine. This one we don't do it, we import it. But are we saying that companies cannot produce this here? They can. We have the feed meal. Then aside the feed meal, once you've gotten this right, we have the parent stock, the, the fertile eggs, the hashery, the pullet rearing, and the layers. These three, that this fourth segment you see, is what the typical businessman sees. He doesn't see the beginning and doesn't see the end. Now, when you take it down, you look at specialized slaughter, specialized poultry slaughterhouses. This is not common. I can decide not to play here. I can decide to play here. All I require is what? It takes six weeks to raise broilers, seven weeks to raise broilers. All I require is get the farmers who are competent in producing birds to just produce for me. And all I will do is to play here. Who am I selling to? Now, increasingly farmers are having, those in this value chain are having one problem. They sell to the new retail outlets, the likes of ShopRite, the likes of Tasty Fried Chicken, the likes. Now, all of these retail outlets have one thing in common that they lack, trust. They give you an LPO for two weeks. They don't pay in two months. I sell my snails to some of these outlets. And they will owe you. You keep coming. They keep telling you to come. And at the end, they distort your what? Your plan. So there is need for us to find, OK, if this is a problem, how can I begin to do what? Answer this problem by having a meat kiosk where I will begin to do what? Do my slaughter and dis display it to the market directly and cut off the middlemen. So you see that there's value to be created here yes. currently. Then we have the live bed market. Remember we have the hotels, the schools. Do you know 
the amount of chicken that schools like LDS consumes on a daily basis. Or put out all the boarding houses that we have. It's enormous. So you can see that there is value in even playing in any of this value chain. But we must take one and say we want to run with this one. If I look at the cassava value chain, the cassava value chain is not about venturing into cassava. It is so much more than cassava. Because right from the, when you pull the cassava stem, you know, you cut it, what do we do with it? When we uproot the cassava, we cut the stick and we throw it away. That thing you are throwing, throwing away is for pig grease. We use it to produce the meal for pigs. When we peel off the first, <laughs> there's a machine that actually peels off. We don't use that machine here. What, you, you, you put it in the machine and pull it out. We don't use it here. What we do is that we peel it manually. When you peel manually, what do you do? You abandon it. That's again another word, resource for your goats and your pigs. But we throw those two away. When you grate the cassava, remember we leave it to ferment. As it is fermenting, what are you doing? You are losing two components, the starch and the ethanol. You are throwing away the starch and the ethanol. The starch is used by pharmaceutical firms. The ethanol is used also by pharmaceutical firms. So we lack what? Capacity to network and integrate the entire system. All we do, this is where we play. Gary, Lafu, Edubo. <laughs> I'm almost done. If we look at the tomato value chain, you can see that it is not as simple as just planting tomato. It has what? Linkages. There are agents. If you pick tomato from the north, and you take it to my 12 market, you will not sell. The thing will decay there. Because of what? The agents. You need to understand the dynamics. That's why we are now having farm gates. Because those guys tasted it and they saw their fingers got burnt. So you are now seeing people setting up farm, tomato farm gates. They take it from the market, they take it to their farm gates. Because they are trying to avoid this um, challenge. So we have the transport and logistic problem currently in the tomato value chain. We have the packaging. We have the greenhouse problem. A lot of people are going into greenhouse. It is very expensive. You need to be trained before you go into this. So we have the warehouse retailing problem and the consumers. Who are the consumers? What exactly are they demanding? We need to find out what they want in order to play in this value chain. In conclusion, Agribusiness is not farming, neither is it totally referred to. We can talk about all the value chain. It will take us the whole day. I just narrowed it to those three. Agriculture is not farming, neither is it totally referred to as agriculture. It is more, sorry, it is more than farming and encompasses the interlinked set of activities from farm to the final consumers. While the income stream from other business can rise, because of the high risk and high returns. For agriculture, it is steady, smooth over time. It can rise steadily over time for 10 years. You may not be super rich, but you're contributing to value, to societal value. But then don't expect the super profit that you get from other kind of business. It is not so with the agribusiness sector. So if your whole idea of venturing into agribusiness is to make money, then agribusiness is not for you. If your whole idea is I want to make quick returns, this sector is not for you. The sector requires significant hand-holding and long-time nurturing. It requires hand-holding. I gave one example. Those days that my father was a yam farmer. He plants his yam. You discover that the yam will come up with six, six eyes. What you do, you remove the five and leave one. Why are you doing that? You want a whole tuba, not scattered tuba. Now, it doesn't stop at that. You use the stick to do what? To guide the eyes of the yam. You keep guiding it every day. Now, why are you doing that? You want a sizable tuba. And you do that for more than seven months. It is not a business that you throw on ground and you run away. So the sector requires significant hand-holding. It cannot be done by proxy. What we do, we set up a farm and put our brothers and relatives to manage it. 
They are not the visionary. They will run it under. It cannot be done by proxy. The owner of the business must be what? The driver. If it is possible for me to leave the business school today, I would have left. Because I bought the land, and I'm still going to buy more land. I know what I want to do. But I cannot now start and begin to run a business that I'm in Lagos and believing it will fly. That's a recipe for failure. Success requires patience, continuous learning, continuous innovation, and embracing new technique. There are so many new techniques in this sector. If we look at companies that are listed here, these are the major, the 10 major players. They play in the agribusiness, play in the agribusiness sector. These are the 10 major players that are exporting in Nigeria. If you look at the first one is Olam. Please, when did Olam enter Nigeria? <laughs> Remember we had flour mills from the, flour mills is at the bottom. When did Olam enter Nigeria? How come they saw what the likes of flour mill did not see? So venturing into agribusiness sector requires training and learning new skills of how best to manage a given sector in the value chain. You cannot succeed in this sector without first carrying a comprehensive feasibility study. Success is not dependent on the government. Infrastructure, no good road, no water. Success in this sector is not dependent on all of those futures because we've seen the likes of Olam succeed where others did not succeed. Success has more to do with innovation and technical change, has more to do with a vision, a clear vision of where you are going. So we can see all of this, that I must have a passion for what I do. I must have a drive for what I do in order to succeed in the agribusiness sector. Thank you very much. The issue of failure of poultry businesses, I'm thinking beyond knowledge of the business. What is the, how do you prepare for eventualities in poultry business? For, for instance, you could have um, some uh, reflections or whatever. I can go into groundnut production and fail. I can go into cashew nut production without looking at the market. There are two varieties of cashew. You have the big, the giant cashew, and you have the small one. What we have is the small nuts. So if I'm planting the small seed, I'm going to end up having the small nut. The small nut will be turned down in the market. Now, there are problems within this value chain. The first thing is that we must understand what we are going into. That was why we started the agribusiness, why Bill and Melinda Gates came to Africa to say the world population will hit 9.3 billion by the year 2050. And we're addressing the food scarcity problem. And they came, came up with sponsorship. And they ran the course in three, in four uh, countries, Ghana, Kenya, Nigeria, and Tanzania. And I was amongst those people that they actually trained. Now, they came in to address one problem, the knowledge gap. Immediately, they, they ran it for two years and took off sponsorship, and we started running it. So we've, we've done the fourth run, and we're about commencing the fifth um, run. 
what we do is that we have a, a way of opening your eyes to some of these things. We don't teach you how to farm. What we do, we teach you how to do business. And agribusiness is business and must be profitably run. So the first thing we do, the first one week, where we look at strategic and critical thinking in agribusiness, sometimes you set out to say, this is what I want to do. When you get into that environment where we begin to brainstorm, you discover that this business that I thought that was lucrative is actually not the business where I want to put my hands. You now find yourself in digressing to other areas. So by the time we are done with the program, you begin to understand the makeup of this business. Let me give you one that addresses this. For every farmer, I know some of us must have had one or two poultry farmers. Once they set up a 5,000 bed, the first thing they do is that they invite members of their church, members of their mods, to come and see. Come and see what God has done for me. Now, listen, serious, very serious, very key. But we teach you this in class, that every one of us, when we come into a poultry, we are bringing in, we are bringing in something that is foreign that will affect the beds. Now, when these people come, they keep holding on to your pen, and they keep praying, God, you that did this for this person, do it for me. When you visit chief farms, when you visit chief farms and you visit the poultry, you don't just go in. It's like taking a bath. And they kit you up to enter that place. So the way we do our farming is that we just, we just start without understanding the process. And we bring in diseases that will do what? Kill the birds. And we blame the devil. That's why I say the fundamental problem is a knowledge gap that we must spend more. I spend 25 million to set up a poultry business. Meanwhile, all that I need is to pay maybe 350,000 to even learn. Because we take you to the field. We take, them to, we take our participants to Songhai Farms where they see the integrated farming and they tell you, they warn you ahead of time. They share some of these things. They tell you what not to do. When you, I have this uncle that started a poultry farm. He was so excited, calculated the profit on paper. <laughs> I started the deep litter system. Now in the area where he set up his pen, a lot of noise. These birds don't want noise. When you blow the horn, there will be stampede. Now they will run from one side of the pen to the other. By the time they get to the end of the pen, there will be stampede. When they are coming back, some are dead. You will lose about 15. He kept on losing birds. He didn't understand the business he was going into. So I think to answer your question, is closing the knowledge gap. Now, if I get your question right. Funding. Funding. Funding, please. You don't take fund to go into agribusiness. You only take fund when you have done what? Passed the what? The first mile stage. When you have survived, that's when you begin to talk of funding. In fact, the banks will chase you because they are seeing your cash flow. At that point, they are chasing you. But you don't have anything, so they won't chase you. Like I said, the multiplier principle in agribusiness guarantees that if I take a comb of corn and I look at how many maize, remember I'm putting two, two. When I'm harvesting, how many will I get? So many. It means that if I have a standard plan, a set plan, a vision of five years, and I say this is what I'm going to do the first year, by the fifth year they'll be looking for you. So you don't use what? Loans to start the business. Because your agribusiness is sometimes prone to what? Depending on what you're going into, it's prone to what? Failure. As simple as the chili pepper, or as simple as the cabbage and the carrots, as simple as those things. If you plant it on a soil that is so rich in pests, when you finish cultivating, they will swarm on them and destroy them. Meaning that one thing that we learn in class is that we must do a soil test. We don't do all of these things. So questions? I think five years ago, I tried to acquire the biggest poultry, integrated poultry farm in the East, the very name for the state. Those are the biggest hatchery. We got everything right. It wasn't a, but an equity led transaction. I got the biggest farm in the North, poultry guys, near, to come and do technical assistance. We had done everything then. 
to trust the government. The government I said that ah, I want to do something else. And after spending all that money and doing research, we lost it. I now made me think that a lot of the effort that we put into spending money to do research, a lot of people at the bitter end don't have that kind of capacity at all. I mean, I don't care whether they spend $5 million. Use your money, like you can weather the storm, you can feed the family. But I'd like to suggest that this, your idea, if not that we came here, we didn't know that such outreach programs existed that not be run by the government. But anything be run by the government, there's always the always bureaucratic issue that make it not to work. So if you put up the sake of argument, a paper ad that says the devil has messed up your farm, come to spend three hundred thousand and get knowledge on not to lose, not three million to lose. You can get people interested and you can now reach it out wider. You can even send out flyers, you know, e proposals that get people to come and seek knowledge so that at the little end, you can nip it in the bud and stop that loss. Because when entrepreneurs lose money, they lose passion. And that one passion is lost to get back into the game. You know. um, I am interested in external forces. Until on us. Now, we are part of ECOWAS, a regional group. And how will that influence our group? And then there is this issue of GMO, genetically modified drugs. And I hear they are pushing them into Africa and other countries. And I hear there have been some disastrous consequences outside. So how do we guide against some of these external forces? Okay. Somebody told me that nearer you are to the ground, before you are, that's a, a big thing. Can you, do you agree with him? On the, <laughs> the first one talked about how do we control external what was happening to us before was that it was easier for you to bring in frozen food from Cotonou into Nigeria. It was easier for you to, the way they preserve it, they use formatly hide, the chemical they use in embalming corps to preserve it because they smuggle these things in. You don't put it in any cooling system. They just coat it with formatly hide and bring it in. Now, it was easier because you have people who accepted it, who didn't understand what they were taking. Again, it was cheaper. Today, it is not the government that has forced us. It is the exchange rates dynamics that has forced us to now say, you cannot bring this thing. If you're bringing, you're going to change dollar to bring it in. If you bring it in, it will be so much expensive, more expensive than the one that you raised here. So it's no longer, it's no longer easy for those people to bring in those um, frozen food. So the market is restructuring. Now, the Nigerian economy is what? Restructuring and resizing itself, devoid of whatever the government is doing. For me, there's no clue coming from the government. But the private sector is, we have this export program. A lot of people came on the program because they are looking for what? Solution. So the people that are thinking are the people that will redefine tomorrow, not the government. The government will come in to make money by way of tax, but we need to get it right as a private entity. So for the second question, what's the second question? The GMO thing, which again is part of what I answered. What we do here is that, that's why I say I take them to two places. I take participants to IITA, I take them to Songhai Farms. IITA because IITA has improved variety of most of the, the, the crops. Some guy farms because they don't do, they move away from genetically modified drugs and they use very simple techniques to produce. So I take participants to see the munching system that they use in producing so that they run away from, just to, to tell you that it is profitable to do it the right way. They do integrated farming. Imagine that, sorry I didn't come with it, I probably would have shown you how they are able to grow maggots. They, they have animal husbandry. Once a bird dies or a goat dies, they leave it to decay. Now, where they leave it to decay, maggots will form. Those maggots, they collect as protein for the fishes. So we do integrated farming, and you're able to do what? Move on without doing what you just said. So I don't think we should go that way. But the exchange rate is now redefining things that you cannot bring in these things. You are bringing it at a higher, at a higher expense. Remember, I shared the rice thing. Our local rice is going for 17,000. The foreign rice in the market, the Thai rice, is going for, for 19,000. By the way, 
when you get to the three markets, we have the Daleko market, you have the auto market. When you get to three of the major markets where they sell rice, if you enter those markets, you're going to see one thing. You're going to see mama gold. There's no mama gold in the market. They are rebagging it. You're going to see all the names that you, those popular names. Tomato, cap rice. Now, when you enter this market and you see cap rice, you see tomato, it's not true. Enter deep into the market, you'll see the machines, how they rebag them. You'll see how they rebag them and how they fool us that we are buying what is not there. So there is need for us to move on and begin to produce for our market. Okay, being close to the ground, I talked about it. I talked about it that I was sharing. Remember, you see all you see Saru Agro Allied here. Saru is number six in the export chain. Now I was with the MD yesterday, and part of what I've been addressed is what we are trying to do: how to tell people what we do, so that more people can come to the classroom and learn. Now I was with the MD, and he shared that when the, when he said he was going into this value chain, he told himself that he wants to play in the value chain where he will help those at the farm level to do a sustainable business by producing the likes of Sniper to, to keep their product, by producing chemicals that will help them. He said he knew what he was going into 20 years ago. He wasn't going into a business where he would struggle, but he was going into a business in a value chain that would be near profitable. However, that is not to say that if you are close to the ground, you're going to be poor. If you're close to the ground and you lack knowledge and you lack skill, and you lack the way we are to be able to produce. Remember, we are in a global village, that if I'm producing tomato inside the forest, and I have access to internet, and I have a website, people will reach me. If you, there's one particular, I didn't talk about it, the pigri. If you go into the pigri, and you're in the remotest part, and you're in the website, and you announce that you have pigs, and you showcase it, they will come. The demand they will come for it. So I believe that if you have the wherewithal and the knowledge and you're closer to the land, you're not going to be poor. I have a couple of takeaways I'm grateful for. One, I'm doing this business by proxy, which you said is a recipe for failure. <laughs> <laughs> yes, it is. Yeah. So um, my challenge here is if it, it you are aiming at uh, agro business, business for export, my greatest challenge is uh, dealing with the port issues in this country because you kept emphasizing that this is a business that we can do without government. So I want you to address that. Um, my question is on the quality of our crops. Okay, you mentioned that some of them do not meet the international standard. I think there was something you mentioned that actually didn't do. Yeah, aflatoxin in our maze. Yeah, especially in those and then some others. My question is, um, are we just going to accept it that you do not meet international standards, or is there a way out? What can we do you know, to remedy the situation so that uh, those who are into such productions can export what they let me, let me talk about the program that we run. Maybe it will help us in... We, we came up with this. It was Bill and Melinda Gay that came up with the program. But we're still running the agribusiness uh, program. But we discovered that it was too expensive. It was a program that the, the fee on that program is over 750000 So we discovered that that price, no person that is going into farming will want to come, come and participate in that class. So LPS decided that they're going to subsidize it on a first-time basis. Now we're going to take it by half by 50%, meaning that participants will now pay 50% of that um, amount on first-come, first-serve um, basis. What we do is that it's a three-leg model. We, the first module is strategic thinking in agribusiness, critical and strategic thinking in agribusiness. We assume that you don't know what you're going into, that you have many things you want to do. So you come into a class and we drill, we bring people who, who are successful in the business to come and talk to you. In that first class, we talk about the value chain. We look at all the value chain. And at the end of that class, we take a trip to the farm. We take a trip to either IITA or Songhai Farm. The preference has remained. Preference to date is Songhai Farm. Everybody says Songhai Farm meets the need. So we take a trip to Songhai Farms. The second module is tag entrepreneurial mindset 
We say agribusiness is business. In the second module, we begin to teach you how not to run a business in this value chain. Now, having passed through the second model where we incorporate entrepreneurship, finance, we use the strategy model to drive that, to drive home the case. We don't teach you how to farm, mind you. We only take you to see the field. The third module has to do with standards and certification. We bring in people from NAVDAC. We bring in quality control. We bring all of them to class to tell you that this is the ABC. If I must go into this business, I must start from the end. If I must do export, I must start my feasibility study from the end. I must understudy and know what I must not sell outside Nigeria. If you look at where we export to, we import from America. We don't sell anything to America. America will not accept anything from us because we don't meet any of the standards. So we need to understand, understudy. That is why we came up with this program that will run a program where we'll begin to build capacity in terms of the people who are going to play in this value chain. And when we do it right, we probably will be solving this challenge. That's what I just said, standard and certification. We bring in the expert to the classroom to tell us what you shouldn't do so that you don't make mistake. A typical example is your cocoa. When you export and the value of your cocoa does not meet the standard, you have lost all. Another example is charcoal. A lot of people veered off into charcoal exports. Now, when they took it to those countries, it was rejected. And you cannot bring this thing back. You lose your money. Yes. Please. The truth is that there are things that we don't have control. I remember I took participants in Ghana to Blue Sky Companies. Blue Sky Companies is into fresh cut fruit. And they sell in four European markets. They produce in Ghana and sell. You know this fresh cut fruit where you cut pineapple, orange, put them in a pack? That's what they sell to four European markets. And they produce in Ghana. And I asked them this same question. How come you are not buying pineapples from Nigeria? How come you are not buying mangoes from Nigeria? You know what they said? They said logistics, customs, that their margin is low and thin. That if they come into the Nigerian market, they will lose everything. That they rather, when they sell to those European markets, they buy, they buy pineapples from Brazil, bring it back to Ghana, cut it, and sell back to those people. So there are some of the things that we are not in what? That's why we say understudy the value chain and know where to play. You don't play in the sector that you'll be hot. The problem is that some of us don't know. We get hot before we realize that we've put our hand in a mess. You say that it's not advisable to go into agribusiness by force. Is there any way to fix it? Or should we wait until we retire? Because a lot of us can't quit what we are doing now as we have interest. Um, I've discovered that in the, in the real world, when you ask questions, you go, go on Google, you check sites, who are supposed to give you information. When you compare it to reality, it's actually not true. It's far from true. So how do we get information that is real? You have said that the program that IBS is running is not really a drink. It's just like teaching me to be an entrepreneur. But there's some facts. You want to do your budget, you want to do your estimates, you want to do your plan, oh, no, and you don't get the real facts. There's something I didn't talk about. Now that program does not just, we don't leave you. The program does not end that way. The program is designed in such a way that if you're going to be an entrepreneur in the farm, in any of the sector, you must come up with a plan. And this plan will mentor you all through that at the end, you're going to defend your plan within the class. And everybody critiques your work. Your work. So you are leaving that class with a bankable plan. Now, having gone to the field, having seen everything, having passed through most of the facilitators, you are now going to do it right. Now, the truth is that when you Google online and you look at fishery, you look at all the farming, they tell you, they give you numbers. They tell you how profitable. It's not true. It's not true. You need to taste it to see that it is not true. They tell you how lucrative poultry is. It's not true. There are things you must be mindful of. But if you don't sit and learn, you will fall into those traps. The proxy farming. Yeah, proxy farming. It is easy to solve this problem. For example, I'm a farmer. I started the pen system. 
and I've abandoned it. I've abandoned the pen system, the snail pen system this year. And I'm going into the free range farm, the free range snail farm. If you Google up the Australian snail farm, the Australian government went into snail research. There's a lot of document on the internet from the Australian government on the free range farm. So if you Google it, you'll see what they've done. Now, I have abandoned the pen system because it is not profitable. It's not a long term sustainable method. So I'm going into the free range farm, but I'm working. So how do I solve that problem? Now you cannot do the snail farming without the plantain. The plantain is a cover crop. They need shade. You can also not do the snail farming without cocoa yam. Cocoa yam is the umbrella crop. They don't, they don't like rain. They hide when it is raining. So you need the umbrella crop, you need the. Now, I have a target of 10 years. In 10 years, I'm going to retire. But I've started buying the land. And this year, I will start planting. I'm not going to launch the snail now. The snail probably will be launched in two years' time. But then, I am not going full all out because I still have about 10 years in the business school. So you can see that I'm planning. Now, you don't wait until retirement before you jump into business. You start putting something. If you're going to retire in the next six years, put up your palm, oil palm, to even hold forth the land. Mm -hmm. In five years' time, that's when you start harvesting. That's when you're retiring. Is it clear now? Five years from today, you want to retire in five years' time, and you have the land. Please don't leave the land bare. Put your oil palm, plant the ones that will come out in five years. So when you're set, remember that in five years, you will not produce anything. In other words, it's not, it's not, the business is not for an active person who is working. <laughs> if you want to train, but if you want to do by proxy, you need to send somebody to the class. You need to train somebody who is your eyes. You need to prepare, that person must have the same mindset that you have. He must drive it and it's dependable and reliable. You talk about the problems with customs and other factors that may prohibit export of uh, certain goods. I'm also aware that the SBS runs a program or had run a program for the judiciary to understand, let them see where they can improve and help other people. Is anything being done? Currently, we have a program that is running. They are in the second round, and they are going to finish the second round tomorrow. It's the export program. And this export program brought all the people within the export value chain to the classroom. It brought the NAVDAC, it brought the the, in fact, the inspectors, it brought all of them to the classroom. It is not a problem that will go away overnight. It's a problem that will go away. It's going to take us a long time for some of those problems. But we have to live with some of these problems. We have to do business realizing that the likes of all arms enter this difficult market and they are succeeding. I worry for um, tomato crop, as it were. Um, when you are dealing with pesticides and it interacts with these crops, how the impact on us humans, because in my mind I think maybe this is what is causing cancer and all that, how do we deal with weeds that interact with these crops without really it penetrating into the crops? I just want to uh, bring one light to the issue of agrotoxin which is something that you know we need to be very careful with even with peanuts that uh, you know we consume and we export some sometimes it happens that when what actually causes aflatoxin is the formation of mold so if we can address it like dehydration especially with the maize and grains you know it will go a long way because it's very deadly and it's killing you know uh, in millions, so we need to address that issue. Of, yeah, and a lot of when I, you know, I shiver when I see people eating peanuts like that without actually, you know, sifting to make sure that there are no molds on those peanuts. That's what affects the liver and it affects it directly. What's the question? Pesticide that you talked about. <coughs> now <coughs> we use. That's why I say the knowledge gap. If you do an open tomato farm, you're prone to all kinds of problems. But if you do a greenhouse tomato farm, where you use hydrophonics, 
Now, these are techniques. I said there are new methods and new techniques of guiding against some of these problems. So if you understand this method and technique, you are not going to run into this problem. We have a young man who comes, who also facilitates in our, in our agribusiness program. He finished in, um, I can't remember the MBA, the AMBA set, three sets ago, and he invested a hundred million in the tomato value chain. Today he's well sought after. He sells directly to the retail outlet, the big retail outlet. His tomato has a shelf life of about 30 days, meaning you drop it, it does not decay, it doesn't go down. It doesn't go down. Today, we call him to the classroom to come and teach us. He was part of the executive MBA class, but today he's doing it right. He's using hydrophonics. So all those tomato diseases did not affect him. Thank you. If we do it right, we probably will get it right and we'll get into this problem. I was just wondering, you know, you have advertised the program for October, and I'm wondering how many people you can reach to make a change in the nation. And I'm also wondering where is the place of the College of Agriculture, the University of Agriculture, the University of Technology? I actually went to, when we started this program, we thought we were going to have something to do with UNAB. If you put my name and you put UNAB, you're going to see Kelikume in UNAB, <laughs> famous University of Agriculture. You're going to see all the good things that they said I, told, I talked about. Meanwhile, I didn't see any of those things. <laughs> now, I went to UNAB and discovered that every tool that they have there is mundane. They have this cashew nut processing factory that will take you five minutes to crack a nut open. Meanwhile, there are better methods. And I told them, you can't be doing this. You can't be teaching people with this. The, the society has left you behind. They have a bakery. The bakery they have, they use the mud oven system. That's a university, a federal university. They use the mud oven, and they were celebrating that they were doing agege bread. <laughs> so I saw a lot of anomalies. Which means that we were, at, we were not saying the same thing at par with what that institute was actually doing. So we came back and said, we cannot do anything with these people. They are miles apart. In fact, they told me that they were starting a medical school. And I asked, University of Agriculture going into medical school. They have a department of banking, department of accountancy, University of Agri competing in that space, all because we are certificate driven. So I left them behind. <laughs> Again, we are thinking of talking to some of these names. We actually penned out some of the companies that we are going to talk to to see how they can come in and a way of shared value to subsidize this so that people can come in. You know, Bina talked about people who don't have money to even pay for this program. So we're trying to see if the co companies, private sector can sponsor people into our program so that we can have more people, more spread. The more people are doing it right, the better for all of us. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. I attended the MP23. Alumni session has been quite interesting and uh, I always look forward to it at every um, date, you know, and it's been quite rewarding. You know, at alumni session, you get to learn new things. You get to learn about how to move on in your life, how to improve yourself, and it's, it's been quite rewarding. Today's alumni session was, oh, as always, has been excellent. You know, the topic was. Um, I was very particular about the topic today because I wanted to know more about the agri business, and I'm a bit skeptical. I'm one of those that has been skeptical. There's this drive towards agriculture, agriculture, and then how will agriculture, you know, make a difference. But today I came out with the, the a proper, you know, perception that agribusiness isn't agriculture. And then it was m so much clearer to me how the agribusiness is going to make a difference. And I think I quite agreed with it. But the alumni session, one of the things it does for me is that, you know, there's always an idea, a small nugget of knowledge to be gotten out. And then it opens up your mind. Today, my mind was 
thoroughly opened, you know, to the value chains, to the different opportunities most of us don't even see in agribusiness. By the time we think about it, we think it's all about farming, all about agriculture. We don't go beyond. There were little, little salient points that came out today that really opened up my mind. And for us, it creates a, a, a whole load of opportunities, you know, for those who attend. And then keeps your eye, mind, you know, active and thinking the next step. For me, I'm going out, you know, having a whole load of ideas on the table and things that I want to talk about, things I want to discuss. And I'm sure it's the same for almost everybody who attended. Another thing for the alumni session is that the questions that, that are being asked brings out a whole lot of things, you know. Even what the facilitator didn't talk about, the questions from all angles, from different perceptions, things you didn't think about. You know, it's like I said, it opens up your mind, brings out ideas or gets you to start thinking and each time each time I attend, there has always been that effect on me. Thank you very much. We've just concluded our, our August alumni session where we had Mr. Aikele Kume talk about Nigeria at a crossroads. Is agribusiness the solution? This was actually a very topical issue which we decided to bring up knowing the current situation in the country. And we had, that was actually played out by the number of people that attended the session. We usually conduct the alumni sessions to ensure that we help to provide our alumni with continuous learning to help them in their careers and in their professional and personal lives even after their time at LBS. We do this on a monthly basis, typically on the last Thursday of each month, and it's always a very good time when people come together, not just for learning, but also for networking as well. Today's session was very good, and Mr. Kelekume did introduce us to the fact that agriculture is not the same as agribusiness, and he emphasized the fact that people need to get involved in the entire value chain and not just focus on agriculture, which is quite at the bottom of the chain. We look forward to having more of our members attend these programs as we deliver them each month, and we hope that we, try, we strive to ensure that we bring topics that are relevant and topical every month. Thank you very much. Today we had a session, a brainstorming session on Nigeria economy vis-a-vis -vis diversifying the economy towards agribusiness sector. And we had, a, we had a very rich session where we talked about the challenges and opportunities in the agribusiness and the way to go about it. We also shared that it is not all that rosy, that farming is not agribusiness and agribusiness is not farming. That agribusiness encompasses a lot of sectors and all these sectors are interrelated and interlinked. That for you to go into this sector, you must understand the value, the value chain, and the, the, the sector in which you want to play. Very rich contribution from the class. A lot of people ask vital questions and we answer them. Lagos Business School, Pan-Atlantic University.